Um, what does digital technology mean to you, to learning and to your members? Yeah, so I think building on what Marsha has said, I mean, you know, I think about it as ways and means that we can make things better for learners and remove obstacles and barriers. And those could be geographic. So recognizing that access to uh, higher education and training may be more constrained in smaller communities, but um, but the jobs in the north, let's say, require post secondary credentials just as much as the jobs in the south do. We need healthcare workers just as much in the north or in small town Ontario as we do in large urban centers. So I think you know sometimes we think about it as a really you know big huge. Um, technology solution, but it can be relatively small improvements in the way that people access uh, learning or how we can remove barriers to, let's say, clinical placements. And hopefully we'll have a chance to dive into some of those things that are actually already happening. Thank you, Marquita. Robert. So um, I'll expand on on that definition maybe a little bit, because I think sometimes as a as a technologist, uh, we really think of digital as about technology, as opposed to what I like to think of it as, is what are the possibilities that that technology allows for? And what do we know about uh, the era that we live in and, and how we introduce technological change uh, and how it's uh, shaped the possibilities for how uh, we organize ourselves and how we build services. And uh, and when we think about some of the things that have happened uh, just in my lifetime and things that I've been directly involved in, you know, uh, obviously the dawn of the internet age, the first SMS, the first BlackBerry, uh, the iPhone, all of these things, uh, you could never ask somebody in advance of, of their inception as to what impact they would have. Everybody got it wrong. Everybody always gets it wrong. I thought that the uh, iPhone was a toy. I thought that nobody would ever hold an iPod up to their ear and talk into it. It would be a ridiculous concept. I didn't see the power of apps. I thought that we already had solved that problem. We already had web browsers. We already had computers. What did we need apps on a phone for? So maybe I'm just really dumb, which is possible. Uh, or maybe it's really just hard to see what the implications are of, of any technology. So when I think of digital, I think about the way it's changed the possibility for us to work together. And I think in our last example, uh, we saw a really, really strong use case of, it's not just the technology, it's how you organize the work, how you construct the team, how you ask the question, how you involve your stakeholders, how you do the design, how you iterate. Uh, and, and it really is to me about building the right team as opposed to picking the right technology. And it really is a methodology more than it is a, a thing, a technology. So I think of digital as a bigger construct. Thank you very much. Those are all great thoughts. And uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase Elisa from this morning uh, or earlier today. Uh, when you can't see the label from inside the bottle. I don't believe I ever said the wine bottle, just for the record. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think your point uh, is quite well taken. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. Yeah. And if we're always in the fishbowl of today, it's hard for us to see tomorrow. So with that in mind, I'm just going to ask you uh, a question that possibly is impertinent, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Do you use a smartphone? I think you do, right? Do you all use a smartphone? Yeah. Does everybody here have a smartphone? Terry doesn't. It's because you're my hero, Terry. Do you use Google? Do you use Apple? Things like that? Do your students use those? So let me ask you this question. Do the technologies that your members use for learning and teaching work the same way that Apple and Google works? Well, I think probably the answer is not. Um, and I don't think that is necessarily because people are not wanting to be responsive. I like the framing around learners. That is really important because people are at different stages of their learning journey. And I think we're starting to recognize, and, and there were a couple of already really interesting uh, presentations on this today, including with ONCAT, that you're not necessarily on a linear journey. I guess the, the 
The thing that I would want to point out is that public post-secondary in Ontario is not charging what the market will bear, unlike Google and Apple. So the um, kind of the benchmark, that's the benchmark. Um, I think we just need to be mindful of understanding that the user experience, if we want to put it that way, with respect to technology um, is is partially at least constrained by the fact that um, we are not charging what the market will bear. So at public college in Ontario, for instance, the average full-time annual tuition is $2,700 a year. And that is a regulated tuition. So then we must find other solutions, whether that's through collaboration across institutions, whether that's via organizations like eCampus, if that is really where the expectations of learners are going. And um, I would build on that uh, in pointing out that Indigenous institutes are in the business of lifelong learning. And so many of the learners tend to be older. And there is this kind of thought that, well, if you're really young, you totally get tech. You're already in it. You know how it works. And it's just natural. Um, and the older um you know, learners, well, you know, it'll take them a while. They don't quite understand. But actually, it's quite the mix. Um, and it's it's not an age thing. It's just awareness and use and knowledge of. Um, and so really from uh, Indigenous institutes, they are really working to meet the learner where they are. So there are some learners who may not have access to the equipment um, and the technology. And so it's provided if, if possible. Um, there's a lot of work through partnerships uh, with eCampus Ontario, which is really great with the VLS. Um, and it really helped uh, our Indigenous institutes to really get into this field in a really big way, uh, which, um, you know, we have, you pointed out Oshki earlier, and Oshki uh, was able to um, hire staff through that initiative. And that staff really helped to build a curriculum with the instructor uh, that uh, could be delivered in a hybrid format in a way that the learners could really resonate with and work with really well. So it's through partnerships that we're, we're able to achieve some of these really kind of daunting, challenging um, uh, tasks or things that we need to do. And these innovative partnerships have been really, really helpful for uh, Indigenous institutes. But both of you have really spoken well about the expectations that learners have when they come to us. And that was my point of asking the somewhat quasi rhetorical question of do our technologies work like uh, Google or Apple? Because of course they don't, because we're not capitalized and we're in fact underfunded mm -hmm. uh, to do the work. In the case of Indigenous institutes, they're, they're not really funded at all, quite frankly. And I think that that's something as we were talking about earlier that, that we should all be uh, concerned about. And Compounding that is something that I, I would say we have like a both a technological debt and a pedagogical debt. We've got a bunch of technology that we bought that we still have to use that may or may not be useful or usable. And we've got a whole system of pedagogies that are wrapped up in those technologies. So uh, Robert, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you and, and ask you the question, how do we amortize that debt or, or expunge it in order to uh, maybe leapfrog into meeting the learners where they are today. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I mean, one thing to build on the, the conversation that we had, if uh, we built a model based on uh, monetizing people's private data, uh, we probably could afford to uh, act like <laughs> Apple and Google, but then I don't know that we would really be fulfilling our mission. Uh, so that's a challenge, right? Uh, how do we how do we do that and how do we take advantage of the best of what's out there and and I think some of the answer is you know leaning a little bit back on my uh, previous experience uh, in the uh, provincial government uh, we did a lot with a little when we looked at how we could collaborate more broadly across not only the sector but uh, internationally in terms of building common tools using open source and, and really looking at it as an open source project. 
Uh, and by using that kind of mechanism, it helps uh, keep you current because you're automatically plugged into a global community of people who have like-minded goals uh, and who are adept at using uh, state-of-the-art technology to help deliver outcomes. Uh, and so I think there's a, a way in which uh, in, the, in the old world, if we had a problem, we would have to go out and uh, have a complex procurement, think about all of our requirements, bundle them all up into a complicated contract, go out and procure something, and all of a sudden we owned a perpetual license uh, for a lifetime of uh, function, and uh, it was very difficult to then go to the next technology. But I think in, in today's world, as much as the vendor community, and I have nothing against vendors, they love them and they uh, are why we are able to provide the services we can, are looking for new ways to lock lock us into a, a model that uh, creates that sort of perpetual uh, need to, to continue to consume a certain type of technology. So I don't profess to have any real answer except an understanding of the problem and, and a way forward that is using uh, what is good about where we are in the world today in which there are many ways to solve a problem and, uh, and use that as a way to move forward sort of more collectively and collaboratively. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great segue into another question that I know we wanted to get to, um, which is ways that we are currently working today that are collaborative. And maybe I'll ask you to comment first about what are you doing in your sector? So Marsha, I'll turn to you first to talk about the Indigenous Institutes and then Marquita, the colleges, and then Robert, the universities. And then we can kind of build on that and say, what can we do across the sectors? So what are some of the examples, Marsha, about that ways that you are working as a, as a sector together? Yeah, well, the consortium uh, certainly is built on a model of collaboration. Uh, and um, uh, just some examples to share is we work together on a wellness project. And what that is, is through COVID, we found that learners were becoming disengaged and were having a, a difficult time through that period. And um, a lot of mental health uh, concerns and stresses on themselves and their family and community. And what the Indigenous Institutes did was they came together and said, okay, what can we do together to help to address this problem? And what they did was they created a wellness toolkit of which all of the IIs can use. And now we've actually expanded that and anybody in, in post-secondary can use it. Um, we have um, worked with Articulate through RISE um, 360 and have uh, developed um, a, a program that the learners can go through to really do um, ensure that their mental health is well taken care of. And the beauty of this is that regardless of where you live, um, what you have access to, it's, it's available uh, free for anyone to use. And the learner works their way through it. Um, it's a fantastic platform. Um, in addition, uh, we've been working closely with uh, both the federal and provincial governments through tripartite discussions. And uh, we've been looking at how can we better collect and analyze data that will help us to really tell our story in a way that, you know, partners will, will better understand. And um, through this collaborative approach, we've come up with a few models that now we need to uh, determine which way would be better for, for the pillar to go to. But those are just fantastic examples of how we've been able to use uh, technology in different ways, being innovative in how we approach a challenge uh, together to find a solution. Great example with mental health, uh, Marcia. Thank you, Marquita. How about you? What's happening in the colleges that you want to celebrate? Um, yeah, I think I think Marcia's pointed out a couple of things that I think are really um, you know overarching themes and really a technology to improve access for people across the province to reduce costs or at least. Um, avoid reinventing the wheel. I'm sure we've all seen that, different institutions working on the same problem, expensive, not terribly efficient, and then uh, doesn't necessarily have the reach across the province. So I think Marsha's example is a really good one. And I think a way for us to think about how technology can solve some of those challenges for learners. The 
the case, the spotlight that I would select is something called Ontario Learn, which is essentially a repository of uh, courses that uh, no matter which college you're at, you can take a course offered at another college and it fully counts to your credential that you're currently pursuing. So if you've ever had that experience of, you know, I'm pursuing a credential and I need that, you know, fundamentals of accounting. I've never personally had that experience just to say I don't do accounting, but, um, you know, you, you need that. It's, it's an important prerequisite, but that particular semester, your uh, college isn't offering fundamentals of accounting. Well, you can go on to Ontario Learn and you can take the approved course at a different college and it'll continue to accumulate towards your existing credential. And I think, you know, public colleges in Ontario have always been very collaborative, very lean, um, and have always been looking for opportunities like that that help the learner continue on their path no matter where they happen to be in their learning journey. So I think that is an excellent example of something that kind of flies a bit under the radar, but allows um, student success to come to the forefront and of course reduces costs and leverages technology. I would say it also reduces a significant amount of red tape for the learners. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it also occurs to me that that's a real outside the fishbowl kind of innovation, right? The, that's a real outside in approach to providing the the credentials that somebody wants. And and quite frankly, it's one of the smarter innovations that we have, I think, in the province. And I would just hearken back to something Rajiv said when answer to a question as to why the colleges seem to be more advanced in Ontario or open educational resources. I, you know, we could talk uh, correlation causation here, but I think that that there's probably, there's definitely a correlation, and I think it is likely causal that the collaborative nature of the colleges has led them to uh, adopt these kind of uh, credential sharing systems uh, in addition to things like open educational resources. So that's a great, uh, great example. Robert, how about you? What's working really well in the university sector right now? Um, I, I'd highlight our, uh, perhaps our work on uh, cybersecurity. I think this is a, a real uh, challenge for all institutions of every size, whether you're a smaller institution or even a larger institution, there's never enough uh, resources to uh, deploy in defense against uh, uh, cyber uh, attacks. And nobody wants to be the one who wakes up uh, in the middle of the night uh, with that phone call that uh, you've been subject to a data breach. And I think that it can only be solved when we create uh, a level playing field for all institutions. Uh, and I'm really uh, pleased, I guess, to say, I mean, I arrived in this sector about a year ago from the mm -hmm. provincial government, where we have an active uh, uh, network across Canada of CIOs that work together on collaborative things uh, and uh, and useful things. But really, since coming to this sector, I've seen that, you know, times 10. And uh, I joke sometimes that I get more emails from my colleagues uh, within Ontario and across Canada than I do from my own institution, because we're constantly trying to figure out how to solve the same problem. And uh, on cybersecurity, we see the, the maturity of organizations like Canary at the national level. Uh, our uh, regional uh, research networks are taking more of an active role, like Orion in Ontario, and stepping up to the plate and filling that gap. But we need support uh, from the federal government, from the provincial government, to help build those shared services. You can't just will them into existence. Uh, and it's very difficult to do them on the back of uh, work that's already happening. Everybody has their own issues, their own problems. It's very difficult to uh, create those types of organizations without uh, intention to, to build something that's going to manage it across the sector. And we saw some good examples. We saw a, a little shared service in Humber around AI uh, that's the seed for what they're going to do uh, amazing things with. And we saw, and I'm going to get the name wrong because I'm new to education, uh, but we saw that uh, sharing of, uh, of uh, credits across. Uh, and that is a example of a, a shared service. It's probably a really tiny little team 
uh, that has a, a very focused mission uh, and they're able to iterate on solutions that are going to benefit the whole sector. And we need more of that. That's on cat. And that was a, a great, I know on cat, sorry, on cat. <laughs> that was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, it occurs to me uh, on cat, where's our colleagues from on cat. Uh, it was a great presentation. Like if you were really successful, you're basically going to render OnCat obsolete, yeah. right? Like in a perfect world, we wouldn't need OnCat because a credit granted anywhere would be a credit received everywhere. So on that note, let's talk aspirationally. What can we do across the sector? I, I was chatting with uh, one of our technology partners and said, what, are you, what does eCampus Ontario do? I said, well, we're kind of like the LCBO of, of uh, of post-secondary education. And she said, oh, you're serving drinks today? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I could, uh, but that wasn't what I intended. So if we were waving a magic wand, as we did earlier, what are some of the things that, that we might think about? Uh, Robert, let's start with you, because you've already mentioned cybersecurity. There must be other things that we can do with if we were to think about these uh, ideas of shared services across the sector. Sure. And uh... You know, I think we we all struggle with sort of the same uh, technology stack, and and one of the things that uh, that you know I always thought about when I was within government, uh, because we have it in spades across, uh, even within a provincial government, but certainly across governments, is uh, you know that sort of issue of reinventing the wheel. We all use broadly the same technologies, uh, and we probably don't do enough uh, to collaborate together, not just on. Uh, procurements, although that's work that we're actively undertaking uh, in terms of uh, how we approach things like Microsoft, right? And it's only through that type of shared action that we're going to make a dent in, in an organization as uh, large and complex as Microsoft. Yet that platform has now become, uh, for most universities, although there are some that are in the Google domain and I admire their tenacity in trying to, to maintain that, um, it has become a central feature of how we deliver our services. It used to be just like, okay, we got to worry about email and make sure people have licenses to use Word and Excel. But you know, beyond that, we don't care. Now it's become this embedded uh, uh, tool that has all of these different features and capabilities. And how do we get control over that so that we're not uh, every one of us spending way too much money on on leveraging those tools? So. There's lots of examples, but again, it comes down to that uh, intentionality around creating an organization that can uh, be built around the concept of, of managing a shared service. And that's something I've done for you know almost 30 years of my career, and there is no glory in shared services. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no matter what kind of organization you work in, and everybody says the same thing, why can't you just reuse that technology? And the reason you can't reuse it is because it was developed by a specific unit for a specific purpose, uh, and they were not created to be a shared service unit, and you can't ask them to help you. You can't ask them to, to I just had this discussion with the library this morning on a shared technology, and they're like, we need you to take this little piece, because this little piece doesn't align with the research mission. And I'm like, but you've got everybody else who knows exactly how this technology to works, and you want me to take one tenth of it because it doesn't align with the research mission. It's like, yeah, that kind of doesn't make sense, does it? No, it doesn't. So let's work on a on a different approach, right? So uh, I think we hard enough to do in your own institution. I'm sure all of you experience that. Very difficult to do across the sector. Microsoft is a good uh, good option, though. Uh, Marsha, how about you? What's uh, what's an option, or what are some ideas that we could work ac across Thank the you. entire sector? Well, you know, as I was when Robert asked me to be on this panel, I thought, oh, let's let's see where we're at, because I thought the Indigenous institutes are not nearly at the level of our, our mainstream uh, colleagues, and so I pulled a stat that uh, as of 2021, 99.3% of urban households had high-speed internet access compared to 59.5% of households in rural and remote areas. And 42.9% of households of First Nations reserves. There's a significant gap. And so my call to action is Let's work together to raise everyone up to the same level. 
there are peoples in our province who do not have access. And uh, if we're all going to move forward as a province ensuring that we have social and economic reconciliation, then it requires all of us to work together in order to make sure that everyone is treated equitably and receive access to the resources and services so that they too can thrive. It's an excellent point. It echoes what Rebecca was saying earlier with her remarks about substantive equity. And it's not just uh, enough to say that this is how we're designing the technology, but we have to ensure that people can meet us there. Marquita, how about you? Well, I think I think we can, you know, I sort of think about it from two perspectives. So one is the institutional. So I think picking up on where Robert was with cybersecurity, absolutely a sector-wide um, solution on cybersecurity seems to make a lot of sense because that is an expensive proposition. It's getting more expensive every day. And everybody needs high levels of protection because everybody's student data and other privacy considerations should be equal, right? Um, so understanding where the technology is going and where there are preventative measures that could be taken, even if your particular institution, you know, um, uh, doesn't have as much resources as maybe some of the larger institutions. So to me, that is an area of, of strong institutional incentive to kind of work together. Um, on the learner side, and again, I talked about access, affordability, reach, the kinds of things that, that college, uh, public college in Ontario are well known for, is around things like digital um, twins and simulations to help provide learning opportunities, clinical placements, hands-on learning across the province. And these are proven solutions um, that can enable learners to get the kinds of um, you know, exposure to learning experiences that they might not get if they are, again, in a smaller community. So taking, you know, I, I fully take on board what Marsha is saying, not everybody is going to be able to access that. But I think um, within institutions themselves, being able to provide opportunities for people to have digital learning opportunities, simulations, digital twins, again, it can be high cause to set that up individually for each course or each clinical placement that maybe you want to replicate, uh, that is something that can be done uh, and has been done uh, uh, in the real world. And then all learners can benefit from that, uh, whether their particular institution has specific resources. The issue of access is actually quite important. It also reminds me of accessibility. Dr. Power is going to give us a talk on this uh, tomorrow. Um, we experienced this morning an issue with the sound. It was a it was a momentary glitch. We rolled with it. We like the glitches. That's how we that's how we know we're human. Um, but I, I'm reminded of uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Yuta Trevorinas at the uh, at OCAD University, who has described. Uh, accessibility issues as being a mismatch between the learner and the environment. And the moment when Stephen was trying to speak this morning, but the sound wasn't coming and there was no closed captioning, we all experienced a functional disability at that moment uh, because we were not able to hear him or understand him. There was no alternative means of, of discussing that. And I think, Rob, it was you this morning who asked the question of, or made a comment about the AODA, that this is one of those like the AODA we could think of actually as a technology, it's a legislative technology that is requiring us all to, to meet the needs of all learners by law. I mean, one might argue that we probably should just do that anyways, um, but humans. So I think the, the, the AODA strikes me as one of those uh, incredible opportunities that we have to work across the entire sector to say, hey, this is something we all need to do. Uh, truly a rising tide will float all boats here. Uh, that runs in in parallel to the uh, the issues of access. I'm going to ask my penultimate question for the finale penale, and I am telling you that because uh, it was then your turn to ask some questions. I mean, I actually have a lot of questions, but I want to give you some time uh, to do this as well. I do believe we will have a microphone runner, or do I have to put my hoodie back on and and run? No, we've got Mike. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Matt's going to have the the. The microphone. I will put the hoodie back on and run around, though, if you really want me to. Um, 
So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the models of collaboration then. And and back in 2020, 2021, when the virtual learning strategy was being established, we worked closely with Steve Orsini, uh, COU, uh, Wendy Johnson was at IIC at the time, and Linda Franklin at Colleges Ontario. And we knew that what we wanted to do was provide site licenses or software licenses for the whole sector. And one of the challenges that we had was uh, you know, I needed a privacy assessment and an accessibility assessment. So did you, but you didn't want to accept mine because you're not me. And Marsha wouldn't accept yours or mine because she's not either one of us. Plus, we also have the same name. So that's confusing. And Marquita was like, I'm not, I have to do it myself. Anyway, my point of saying this is the entire sector did come together in January of 2021 to put together one software license that everybody could agree to, one privacy assessment, one, et cetera. So it's possible is what I'm trying to say. There's hope because we've done it once before. I know what you're saying. It was a pandemic. We were all you know, in that mode, but I still think that, you know, Homi K. Baba said, always the state of emergency is the state of emergence. And I think that that is uh, an analogous situation that we have here. So that was a long-winded preamble to saying you have models of collaboration. Let's talk about a few other things that we haven't talked about. So AI and disruption, you inferred this earlier. What can we do together on AI and the disruption that that is doing? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think, again, we saw today uh, an example of how uh, an institution is taking a thoughtful approach. And I think if I looked across uh, the sector uh, and I looked at uh, what uh, my colleagues are doing, uh, everybody is trying to uh, dip their toes in the water. Uh, and there isn't just one, you know, AI is not some monolithic solution that uh, we just deploy. It's kind of like saying technology will solve our problem. Uh, it's what kind of technology, what kind of tools, what kind of AI. Uh, and uh, it comes inherently with its challenges. So I think having that sector-wide understanding of, of what are some of the challenges, uh, we were having an engaging uh, conversation at our table on uh, some different uh, approaches to um, dealing with those challenges. And the question was, do people understand that AI isn't the solution to everything? And uh, right now, I mean, especially if you're in the vendor community, uh, it is, uh, because it has to be. Because if you don't have an AI, nobody's going to buy your tool. Um, but is it really the right solution uh, for every problem? The answer is no, of course it's not. Uh, just like blockchain wasn't the uh, solution to, uh, you know, uh, getting rid of lawyers. Remember when blockchain was going to get rid of lawyers? That was quite a, quite a pronouncement. Uh, so... Um, that hasn't happened. AI won't solve all our problems, but it is a tool in the toolkit. We all need to understand what it's good for, what its challenges are, and how we can leverage it. And uh, And I'm glad to see that we're starting to do work to do that, but definitely more that we can collaborate on there. Marquita, any ideas on how we can, as a sector, leverage AI and disruption for our own advantage? Well, AI and disruption. Um, it's interesting you put those two things together because I think, you know, part of the focus has to be on um, how is it going to disrupt the learning journey? And that can be in a very positive way. I mean, sometimes we use disruption, we think maybe it's a negative thing, but it doesn't have to be a negative thing. I think there's lots of uh, positive aspects to it. Again, it is um, a lot for people to navigate on their own. So for me, part of the solution is really places like this, ways that we can push things out. It has to, you know, we have to adapt much more quickly. And that is part of the disruption of all of these new technologies is that it is, um, there are things, expectations, new technologies that people need to respond to in a much faster cycle than maybe was true even five, six years ago. And we know that uh, post-secondary, uh, um, post the, the staff and the faculty in post-secondary are stretched. Things have become more um, difficult. New things are more difficult to um, take on board right away. So I think really part of the solution is exactly these kind of forums where we can try to leapfrog 
learn from what somebody else has done and try to take that on board for our own institution or find a group of like-minded institutions. And it doesn't have to be just within colleges, but across the different uh, elements of the system to work together in coalitions of the willing. And again, there have been really great proven approaches like that, that have started off as sort of coalitions of the willing. And then people have looked at that and, and been thinking, oh, I, I like that. I don't want to be on the outside of that. I can jump on in. And sometimes that is also a good way to do it. Um, you can move a lot faster. But again, I think the disruption is coming at least as much from the technology as it is from the speed of adaptation that's going to be required uh, from here on in. Thank you. Marsha, please. Yeah, I, and AI is fantastic. I think the challenge that we're facing with it is that there's a lot of miscommunication out there, misinformation uh, that, you know, uh, you know, if you look at it from the Indigenous perspective, Indigenous pedagogy, there's their rewriting of history that's not correct. Uh, so, you know, for all of us here is to ensure that the information that's being uh, put out there, that we all check to make sure it's it's accurate and, and correct it and ensure that our Indigenous uh, knowledge keepers uh, and elders, that their voices are reflected in that uh, uh, information that's being uh, put out there. Thank you. So I have uh, three fast questions, separate ones for each panelist, and that's your cue to think of your own question. Matt, put up your hand again. Where is Matt? He's right at the back. He's ready with the mic. He will run to you immediately. Uh, you should ask a question because he's... Um, so Marquita, let's, let's start with you. So you've already talked about Ontario Learn, which is a, a great example. Uh, what, are, what are some of the other strengths that you see that we can build on as a sector and that how we can grow and learn from those? Well, I think things like um, the Ontario Library Service. Are you asking me about specific examples that already exist or Blue Sky? Both is, is fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, I mean, I think public colleges in Ontario have always been very, very collaborative and that is partly kind of the DNA, but it's also partly because... Uh, resources are often constrained and our institutions may be smaller and further afield. As I said, reach is a big part of the value proposition of the public college sector. So that means reach, as Marcia noted, across northern and rural communities where you really need to be able to leverage the strengths around you. So Again, I want to uh, showcase the power of being able to bring people together, and that can be expanded into cross-institutional collaboration. And by, by that, I mean, you know, make that available to other elements of the post-secondary sector in Ontario. Um, I, I guess the last thing maybe I'll just add is around um, the need to think about uh, talent as a really critical part of the work that we do. So really thinking about how do we ensure that we are able to continue to be attractive for the talent that we need in the post-secondary education system. And I can say more about that if we're interested later. Thank, thank you, uh, Marquita. Marsha, uh, you talked a lot about uh, access and lifelong learning, and I want to maybe just focus on um, what are some of the, the things that Two, two parts of this question, I guess. Uh, first of all, uh, to take uh, Marquita's point, what's the blue sky future and how can we help you get there, I guess is, is what I would like you to, to answer. But what are the ways that you are going to contribute to that? Uh, and what can we do to support Indigenous institutes for substantive equity? Yeah, thank you, Robert. And, and this is the crux of it. Like, we need a lot of support in order to convince the policymakers and funders to... Um, really invest in Indigenous institutes. Uh, while we are the third pillar of post-secondary education, we certainly are not treated as such. And so, um, you know, your support in speaking to those who do make those decisions as to where in which they want to fund and uh, point out to the, fa the fact that uh, Indigenous institutes are not being funded equitably. And in fact, governments have a legal obligation to fund Indigenous institutes. So you mentioned that this morning, actually. In fact, uh, Indigenous peoples are the only 
people in this country to whom we have a legal obligation to provide post-secondary education. And we are not doing that as a country. Absolutely. And so, you know, your assistance in working with us um, to ensure that uh, our governments are living up to their legal obligation uh, would be absolutely helpful and welcome. And we will partner with you. We'll happy to meet with you and talk to you about how we can uh, move that forward. Thank you. Um, so uh, last uh, cracker barrel question to you, Robert, and then we'll open it up. I um, want to just come back to how best can we support digital inclusion and better access? Sure. Well, I think we heard about some of the challenges of uh, rural communities, indigenous communities in terms of um, providing that access. Uh, and, and the answer isn't to go backwards, uh, because digital technologies are an amazing tool to promote inclusion. Uh, and I know throughout my career, I, I actually was the CIO for the Accessibility Directorate. Uh, at the time, uh, we were uh, kind of reinventing the whole compliance uh, framework and technology. But more important than that, it opened my eyes to, uh, we need to go beyond just that. Uh, there, AODA to me is kind of a baseline of, of what we need to do, but there is so much more we can do uh, for specific uh, accessibility needs in communities. Uh, and they are, um, you know, uh, rabid adopters of technology because it helps uh, drive inclusion. It helps them to participate uh, in the in the world we've made today. So we need to bring people up uh, and and get the tools into their hands. And then we need to think about how we give people better control uh, over their own information. Digital is about data and information. If there's any message in the digital revolution, it's about the accessibility and usefulness of data, both for good uh, and for bad. And we see lots of examples of bad. But one of the things that, that we can focus on that I think ties into this community and is driven through programs uh, that we saw examples of today, credentials, the ability for people to own their own data. I think that's a really powerful uh, tool that we can put into the hands of people. Uh, and it really is about making people their own data integrators. Too often we rely on third parties and others to share and integrate our data. And I think that leads to some really negative outcomes, include the loss of uh, what I would call data sovereignty. Uh, and I think that technology can help us uh, restore that balance and create control over uh, our own data. And that to me is the real lesson of digital. If we can put power back into the hands of people and give them uh, agency over their own information, we can really uh, design things that will uh, lead to a more inclusive uh, experience. Thank you. Um, so we're going to throw this open to uh, questions. And when somebody thinks about the question and puts up their hand, it occurs to me, Marquita, you said earlier that we're not capitalists like Google or Apple, but if we, we establish a platform co-op for every uh, student in this uh, province to uh, participate in uh, co-ownership of their data, we could then license those data in an anonymized format and therefore capitalize the system. I don't know. I think that was actually uh, Robert's uh, suggestion, uh, not mine. <laughs> well, there's uh, a blue sky thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a question. Jenny. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your panel conversations and your great questions, Robert. Um, I have a question around transformation with students. So... In Ontario, we have something close to a million post-secondary students, and they have tremendous capacity to think about the problems that you're talking about here and to actually solve them, including the equity access to internet and other things for Indigenous institutes. How can we, and each of you, how can you imagine that we can leverage that kind of power to help us solve the problem? Anybody? Marquita? Well, I think that's a fantastic idea and uh, something that could be amenable to a kind of challenges approach as has been used in other fields. So uh, yeah, yeah, Robert. <laughs> yeah. Stop broadcasting. We're doing a startup right now. That's what, that's what I love too, these hackathons, right? You can give them the the challenge, the the issue to solve and let them go at it. Um, you know, creating those spaces where they have that freedom 
to explore and find solutions, I think is great. And that's forums like this uh, uh, is a great way to start to do that. Hello. Oh, okay. Hi, um, thank you so much for the insights on this panel. And my question actually um, relates to that previous one. Um, I think today we've heard a lot about like the idea of foresight and what that means in, in relation to technology and growing with student needs and um, how technology evolves and adapts as well to student needs. Um, and we know that like student needs can change very quickly and very dynamically as like circumstances change. We saw that with the pandemic as well. So my question is, as you like as representatives of each pillar of post-secondary right there, um, what mechanisms do you currently have in place to leverage student voices and meet them where they're at to adapt to those needs very quickly? Great question. Who wants to take that on first? I can go since uh, you know, I, I I think it's a it's a really appropriate and good question. I think we can apply that to to all of our stakeholders, but if we take students uh, in particular, um, I think, again, going back to sort of the culture of digital and, and what a university is, uh, being new to the sector, I perhaps was a little bit surprised uh, at how kind of far behind we were in terms of our application of technology, because sometimes from the outside, you think of universities as bastions of, uh, of uh, forward uh, progress and technological innovation, and we do have that. Uh, in spades with our students, with our faculty, uh, and the question is, how do we harness that? Uh, and ultimately, at the core of any university is is the scientific method uh, and uh, the idea of, uh, of formulating hypotheses and testing and iterating. Uh, but I don't think we bring that to the way that we do technology change. And digital is all about that. It's really about taking that uh, scientific method and leveraging the fact that we now have technologies that we can quickly try things. We can try AI, we can discard things that don't work, but to do that, we need to bring our, our stakeholders into the conversation and have them actively participating as part of the team. So for example, you know, one little chat bot that we're doing at Guelph, it's hard to get students time because they're so busy. And when they're not stressed out about exams, they're standing in the line for the registrar's office. Mm -hmm. So we were doing a registrar's chatbot. So I said, okay, go out there, stand uh, in line with the students, show them what you're building because it's a tool for them and ask them if, uh, if they want to participate, we'll take them to the head of the line. Just little ways that we can go out there and try to get them because I know they want to be engaged, but sometimes it's hard because they're they're overwhelmed with a lot of other things. Uh, but I, I really want to try. Can we get Air Canada to adopt that? If you uh, <laughs> participate in the thing, you go to the front of the line, just saying. Uh, Marsh, what are ways that you are <laughs> see to answer the question about engaging students? Yeah, that's good for Air Canada. I love Air Canada. Great idea. Um, so, you know, at, at Indigenous Institutes, they have uh, what are called student uh, support uh, workers. Uh, um, and they really uh, engage with learners on a daily basis, daily, um, and really develop strong relationships with, with the learner. And so Indigenous Institutes are able to respond quite quickly uh, to the needs of the learner, uh, which might be a little different in, in other institutions, um, but that's what makes us quite unique. And uh, they do uh, contribute to um, everything that we do. Uh, in fact, today I met with um, a group of, of learners and uh, one of our partners, CIBC, and they pointed out something that needed to be changed and we're gonna do it, we're gonna change it. Um, so student voices are absolutely critical. They're embedded in everything that we do um, and really help to guide our work. Marquita? Yeah, I don't I don't have a huge amount to add. I do think that um there every every college has ways and means of being responsive individually to students. Um, and so they will continue to do that. And, and so they must do that. Uh, what I would say is that, um, it's not a one size fits all answer. 
right? So the average age for a student at college is a lot higher than it is for a student at university, for instance, right? Average age of a public college student is over 23. And most of them by, by quite a lot, by quite a large margin are not coming straight from high school, which means that their experiences, their needs are, are quite different. And I think making sure that, um, you know, part of this is like, the whole debate around how much should be offered online, how much should be flex, different learners have different preferences. And I think that is also what makes it more challenging because different modes of delivery then become more expensive. So I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to dodge your question. I think a lot of that is happening on the ground. I think it is just really important to recognize that it's not a single solution, not not, you know, listening to students is going to provide the solutions for everybody. There will be different answers required for different learners in different elements of their learning journey. It's amazing. Um, we are just over time, so I guess I'll I'll end there. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Marquita and Marsha and Robert for such an engaging conversation. Uh, I think at a time when we have certainly a financial uh, issues, uh, but we also have these existential issues. There's a lack of trust in institutions outside of our boundaries. I, I wish that everybody could could witness conversations like we have had today, because I'm sure that it would increase the trust in the institutions, particularly when we get to uh, listen to leaders such as you talk about ways that we can work together to make a better system. So please join me in thanking our finale panel. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Well, what a fantastic way to wrap up the first day of TEST 2024. And we're not finished yet because we have an amazing birthday party coming up at four o'clock in just a few minutes. And just thinking about this past day, there have been many moments shared shared informally, shared formally in this room and at the other breakout rooms among the um, sponsor booths, et cetera. I saw people in that photo booth, so some special moments happening there. And I'd love to hear if there's a mic runner, what would be, would anyone like to share who hasn't shared yet, something that you've been sitting on that you'd like to share that was something that stuck out for you today, something that you're gonna think more about or be talking about on your way home? or with your colleagues when you get back to work on Wednesday morning. Anyone want to share a special moment? Are you fatigued and ready for your pick me up next door? I think I just want to reflect, Robert, that statement that you made, always the state of an emergency is the state of emergence, was really powerful. And I think that was so emblematic of the theme of transforming together. And we've heard that. And certainly we know there is a climate emergency. We've talked about the equity, the substantive equity, inclusion, accessibility emergency that we're facing. Gen AI, I think has generated an assessment and pedagogical emergency. We'll hear more about that tomorrow. Um, we heard about the insights around how important decolonization, indigenization and reconciliation is a crisis and emergency in this country and in this province. And everyone following Alex Usher's blog or alive in post-secondary, I think would appreciate that the sector is facing a financial emergency right now. And so, and an existential one too. And yet we've also heard some solutions, some substantive ones. I see you've got your hand up. Did you wanna jump in? Okay, really quick, bring that mic over to the middle table. The gentleman has his hand up. Yes, here it comes. Thank you, Robert. Okay, Robert's doing the, but you're not wearing your hoodie and you're not evoking hoodie envy among us wearing your hoodie. Thank you. And just introduce awesome. yourself. Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Jonathan Bloomfield. I'm a teacher who taught myself how to code and I'm spending a lot of time coding out teacher productivity through teacher productivity tools through a company that I started called Adventive. Um, one of the things that's been top of mind in many of the conversations that we had, and I'm going to speak with you about this uh, very shortly, is this idea of using chatbots as the interface of choice when using large language models. And one of the things that I kind of wanted to put in everyone's ear as you think about how you can use these technologies is that 
there are many different types of interfaces that you can use when it comes to transmitting or displaying or having people interact with information. And one of the terms that's kind of been buzzing on the tech side of things is this concept of generative UI. So not just using artificial intelligence to summarize text or spit out words, but to code software in a way that actually builds out interfaces based on the inputs that you're getting. And that's something that could be very interesting to you and to you and a few others in the room. Oh my God, love that deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Generative UI. Like we are here, these terms are so expansive. Mind blowing. Thank you. Thank you for that as well. And tomorrow we've got an incredible keynote, morning keynote from Dr. Rob Power, focused on collaboration and co-creation to transform access to learning. We have another incredible panel that's going to happen, more concurrent sessions. Now, as you go out, the celebration wall has more stars. We're building a little Milky Way. We need a galaxy. We need like a huge universe of stars. And the photo booth, I think, is still available. So if you don't have your little photo strip to put by your desk, there is still time. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to the eCampus TESS 2024 sponsors. I'm gonna name them. The Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities, Instructure, PebblePad, Align Designs, CCI Learning, Contact North, Contact Nord, Jove, Oncat, Caton, and IIC, the Indigenous Institutes Consortium, and body swaps. So we are now adjourned to the eCampus 10th anniversary reception. Enjoy, have a great evening. Thank you.